my gentle and of course very modern apes, I forgot to tell you guys something. I've been keeping a little bit of a secret from you. On this channel, Guts at Gibbon, I have been known to occasionally cover the topic of young earth creationism, which is the evangelical belief that posits the earth is approximately 6,000 years old and was created more or less in its current state around 6,000 years ago by God in a supernatural ex nihilo event. Boo, Guts at Gibbon, hiss. Once again, I am here to leave a comment talking about how it's stupid to cover Young Earth creationism. Why would anybody bother? And to that I say... So, you know, I bother. So, a while back I did a video titled The Cognitive Dissonance of Jason Lyle. Now, Jason Lyle is a young earth creationist and astrophysicist. He holds a PhD in astrophysics. And a lot of people were frequently emailing me saying like, how could he possibly hold this idea? What do you think? And after taking a deep dive into the claims that he typically makes to support young earth creationism and comparing that with his secular work, I've come to the conclusion that it's it's gotta be cognitive dissonance. The arguments that he makes in favor of young earth creationism are completely untenable for someone who has an education like he does. When I say that to be clear, the arguments, some of them, are still used by convicted domestic abuser Kent Hovind, who is notorious for being a bad young earth creationist who is looked down upon by other young earth creationists, and Lyle is using some of the same arguments as Kent. If that's not enough for you, it's worth noting that one of these arguments, specifically the recession of the moon, is listed on the Institute for Creation Research website, that's where Lyle used to work, as an argument that like shouldn't really be used. Because it's a bad argument that doesn't work and doesn't show any kind of support for young earth creationism. It is nonsensical. And I don't want to call him a liar, so I, I think it's probably cognitive dissonance. Anyways, I also made a video a while back on expertise and how dangerous it can be when someone who isn't an expert in a subject confidently makes claims about that subject. This isn't to say that people aren't allowed to talk about subjects they don't have a degree in. You should just be well-read and well-sourced and make sure that you're able to back up your claims both with arguments and with data. The long and short of it is, you should be responsible when you're teaching or informing someone else about a subject, whether you're an expert in it or a very well-read layman, thus making you kind of like a self-taught expert on the subject. You should always cite your sources, no matter who you are and what you're claiming, and especially so if you're going against a well-known paradigm. This kind of caution is rampant in academia. So for instance, if I wanted to talk to one of my professors about the jaws of Australopithecus, and they happen to be an expert on the teeth of Australopithecus, they're going to tell me to go talk to someone who's an expert on Jaws. There's very much an attitude of staying in one's lane, and this is typically because when you have a PhD in a subject and you're an active researcher in that subject, you know that one thing very, very, very well, and a lot of other things pretty well, but if you're you know, approached by someone who wants an expert in here, you're going to send them to someone who knows that particular specific subject very, 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 very well. It's just how it is. So you can imagine my surprise when I see Dr. Jason Lyle, who has a PhD in astrophysics, on an apologetics channel talking about the viability of human evolution. That's suspicious. That's weird. It's not like a slightly different subject within your field. It's not in your field at all. It's not even in a field adjacent to your field. It's a completely different letter on the STEM acronym. So I first watched this thing a couple of months ago and I sat on it and I thought about it and I chewed over making a video on it. And while I was chewing it over, actively masticating, it turns out that Lyle was scheduled to appear on like a call-in show on another apologetics channel. So I called in and the attitude was really different. So after I talked with Lyle, I dug a little bit more into some of his other speaking arrangements and things that he has said in the past. And I shot him an email to let him know that I had made a video called The Cognitive Dissonance of You, Sir. That was months ago and I never got an email back. So now we're here making this video. And what we're gonna do is we're going to watch 
the highlights, the main points of the initial video, and then we're gonna look at the entire conversation that I had with Lyle after that video came out, and then we're gonna kind of assess the whole situation. I don't dislike Jason Lyle as a person, but I'm gonna be busting his chops pretty hard in this video as far as what he's saying and the claims that he's making. And I'm also going to make a few notes on the difference between how he behaved on Revealed Apologetics and how he behaved when he realized he was talking to a person that he couldn't BS. As usual, the clips you're gonna be seeing from the content I'm covering is going to be sped up by about 20%. This is not because I'm trying to emasculate people as some folks in the comment section have occasionally sort of implied. Instead, it's so that I don't get hit with undue copyright claims because I would win those copyright claims, but what they do is they slow down the monetization of a video once it's released and it causes it to not be as favored by the algorithm. So I speed it up to get ahead of this thing Again, this is a review and a critique of the material presented by these people, so it is absolutely unequivocally covered under fair use, but we're going to keep it sped up anyways. Well, without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Lyle on the screen with me. How are you doing, Dr. Lyle? I'm very well, thanks. You know this is going to be a good and honest representation of evolutionary theory when the backdrop is the freaking march of progress, but extended back to, I guess, the last universal common ancestor. Now I say that knowing that my intro is basically like an animated march of progress, but I have a little asterisk that explains that this is like for entertainment purposes and that the march of progress is not an accurate way of representing evolution or how it works. Every time you come on, Dr. Lyle, everyone always says, when is Dr. Lyle going to be back on? So people really enjoy what you have to say. Whenever Poochie's not on screen, all the other characters should be asking, Where's Poochie? I don't know, maybe oh. it's your cool shirts or the background, their books in the background. People like you, man. <laughs> Eli, you're wearing a button down too. You're both wearing button downs and the button downs are the same. They're just different colors. And you also have books behind you as well. So exactly how is your setup any different than his? I think he's just being nice, but it's funny to point out. I just want to, before I get into my questions, why don't you um, share a little bit about your background um, even though it's not specifically on evolution. This would be like having a dinosaur paleontologist on and then interviewing them on the subject of dark matter. Like, no, Dr. Lyle's expertise is not on evolutionary biology. It's not even on anything in biology. Okay, well, I, um, I, I fortunately, I'm blessed to have been uh, brought up in a Christian home. Uh, my parents are believers, and um, most of my extended family really are uh, Christians, and, and I feel very, very, I don't take that for granted. I know not everybody has that. And so I was introduced to Christ when I was very young. I received him as my Lord and Savior when I was about six or seven years old. I kept this in because Lyle is not the only young earth creationist PhD holder who has this story. The born and raised a young earth creationist who then went and got their PhD. In fact, I'm doing some research behind the scenes, but it seems like most, if not all, of the PhD holding YECs have this story, which is very interesting to me. Why has no one ever been convinced to be a young earth creationist by the evidence itself? Like, where are the non-religious people or non-young earth creationists who went to get their PhD in biology or geology or something along those lines who then got to that higher level of education and in the midst of it was like, oh my god, this evidence is insufficient. Clearly young earth creationism with its superior pile of evidence over here must be correct. I can't find anyone who fits that bill. And if creationism is so clearly true and evolution in the ancient age of the earth so dumb and stupid actually, then like where are all these people? Lyle goes on to briefly talk about how he has an interest in all kinds of science, so even though he's focused on astronomy, he really does enjoy talking about geology and biology and researching it, which great, just let's see those sources, we're not gonna see them. Some scientists, they really, they really like their field and they just ignore all others. I'm not like that. I like them all. I think they're all fascinating. Biology and geology, it's all, it's all amazing to me. And then he goes on to talk about how he got interested in the sort of creationism evolution conversation in college and what his conclusion after looking at the evidence was. That is, if you have the right presuppositions. And then it was really in college where I really started getting into it. I really started researching um, the science that, that lines up with uh, creation, which all science does when you understand it, when you have the proper sure. presuppositions. When you have the proper sure. presuppositions. Presuppositions. Oh, he's a presuppositionalist. You didn't know? 
Cool, so if you just assume young earth creationism, then you can do your best to force fit all the data into that narrow-minded interpretation of the Bible, got it. I think the precept argument is dumb and lame, and I think that there's plenty of theologians out there who agree with me. A brief search has shown that to be the case. Now, it's true that everybody has presuppositions, and Lyle and I share many of our presuppositions. For instance, we both presuppose that our senses can transmit generally reliable information. We both presuppose that the Earth generally follows its own rules consistently across space and through time. It's just Lyle presupposes that the Christian God of the Bible, as he interprets it, did it that way, like set up those other presuppositions, and I say that I don't know. But how does his presuppositionalism help him with, like, theistic evolutionists, or Muslims, or Hindus, other people of faith? Well, it doesn't, does it? And his presuppositionalism is, I guess, going to assume that his interpretation of the scripture is correct, which is something a great many Christians would disagree with him on. I wonder how Lyle justifies his interpretation as the correct one. I wonder if he thinks that he's gotten some divine revelation or if he feels that he's reasoned his way through it. I don't know the answer to that. My first question will be in light of the fact that evolution is an umbrella term, can you define for us what evolution is, generally speaking, and perhaps get in more of the specifics as to the different kinds of evolution and where they kind of cross hairs with um, the Christian perspective, where we want my, our antennas might be going up and saying, well, wait a minute, I'm not sure if that's, if that's a position that, that we want to hold. So Lyle does a decent job explaining evolution, at least in the context of common descent. He kind of leaves out like the actual definition of evolution, which is a change in the allelic frequencies of a population over time, which is like the, the generic evolution is. Um, and when he talks about common descent, he also, I believe, makes a bit of a flub up where he talks about how the majority of mutations are detrimental. As this thing reproduces, mutations affect the DNA and that changes the traits that are expressed. And since these, this is all accidental, all the mutations are just mistakes, they're not planned. Uh, most of those uh, are harmful to the organism. Some of them are immediately fatal, but those, those aren't passed on. And the idea is every now and then a good one occurs. When in reality, the majority of mutations are actually wholly neutral. All mutations are mistakes. They're errors in DNA replication or protein synthesis that cause some kind of permanent change to the structure itself. And if they happen in the gametes, they can be passed on to the offspring. But most mutations aren't bad for an organism. Most of them aren't good either. Like I said, they're neutral, and this is because they happen in unimportant places most of the time. They talk for a while about whether or not abiogenesis must be discussed alongside evolution, and Eli, the host, is like, people are always saying abiogenesis is a different question, but is it? And then Lyle is like, well, kind of, but you do need abiogenesis before evolution, like, chronologically speaking, if you want to take a naturalistic perspective. But like, that's not really how science works. You don't take a position and then try to prove it. You evaluate the data that you've collected through observation. And our data unequivocally shows quite a few things. Evolution is happening today. Evolution has been happening for a long time, and that long time spans approximately 4.5 billion years. There's no getting around that. To say that you need to prove abiogenesis before you can support evolution is like saying that there's a car crash over here and you need to know like where and when the car was made and manufactured before you can accept that in the last 15 minutes the car crashed into a tree before your very eyes. Eli then says something along the lines of, people are surprised that the creation evolution controversy is still a conversation. What would you say to that? And Lyle's like, heh, it isn't still a conversation. Creation has been proven. That being said, not everyone has been convinced of that proof. Not everyone has even heard right. that proof. In fact, right. most people have gone through a public education system where have, they have simply been indoctrinated to believe that evolution has been proved beyond question. So I went to a young earth creationist middle school where they taught us young earth creationism fervently. And it was the data that was found within the public school textbooks that my school utilized that convinced me that young earth creationism was absolute bogus. So I wasn't indoctrinated. The opposite, actually. It was an uphill battle as far as they were concerned, as far as anybody would be concerned. But the data convinced me quite easily once I had a hold of it. Now, in the global scheme of things, I'm probably in the top 1% of people who are educated in young earth creationism. I have studied the heck out of this as an idea, um, usually 
mostly primarily from the perspective of someone who's interested and wholly unconvinced because I find it fascinating that someone could hold such an idea. I know all the hypotheses, I know all the arguments, or at least, you know, that's hyperbole, of course. I know a lot of them and they're wholly unconvincing. I say this, of course, as someone who was once convinced. He goes on to say that when you ask people why they accept evolution, they say things like, well, you know, all the scientists believe it, or the fossils, or the genetics, and then they don't elaborate. And uh, they don't really know the details. Uh, if I ask them how you know that, well, fossils, if I ask them which fossils, they don't know. And it's like, yeah, Dr. Lyle, because most of these people don't have like a formal education outside of their high school biology class. Of course they take the word of the people who are experts in this topic. You do that all the time. Every time you go to the doctor, every time you trust your mechanic, every time you call your plumber, this is how society functions. Not everybody can be an expert in everything. But the argument that he constructs is very interesting because he kind of puts it like when you ask the paleontologists, they say genetics supports evolution. And when you ask the geneticists, they say the fossils support evolution. Okay. If you were to ask a geneticist, what is the best evidence for human evolution? If he's really studied the topic, he will probably not say genetics. He'll say, well, probably fossils. Okay. And if you ask a person who's an expert on fossils, what's the best evidence? for evolution. They will probably not say fossils. They'll say, well, we think the geneticists have it figured out. And like, I don't know who he's talking to, but I talk to geneticists and paleontologists on the regular, and both of them think their field is the best support for evolution because it's the field they're most familiar with. Of course, I usually have to prompt them because they're like, what do you mean supports evolution? Evolution is like the foundational cornerstone of biology. Are you talking to creationists? They're still around. And like the fun part about this is I specialize in human evolution. I'm in biological anthropology. So when I go to things like the AABAs, I'm surrounded by people who all find best support for evolution is the thing they're studying. And I've, I've experienced this kind of cross-disciplinary circular reasoning in my own field in astronomy where they try to age date things and they rely on the geologists, but the geologists are relying on the astronomers and so on. And I've experienced that in my, in my own educational. Mm. Well, that's kind of absurd, right? Because geologists don't date things using astronomy. They date things using radiometric dating and rates like deposition or erosion or sedimentation or var formation or coral clocks or ice cores or dendrochronology or a million different things. Anyways, I had to kind of pull a couple clips from a little bit later in the video to kind of make this part cohesive. So we're going to get back on track. Now I would imagine people listening to this, maybe some unbelievers will listen to what you just said and said, that's, that's ridiculous. Dr. Lyle, you're, you're out of your mind. Evolution is the majority position in academia today. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, Mr. Um, Dr. Lyle, you're the one that is on the outskirts of believing something that is akin to, say, believing in a flat earth. You've heard all this. I mean, some Christians who disagree with me will say something along those lines. Um, mm -hmm. So how, how would you respond to that? I mean, a lot of Christians feel intimidated by holding to a creationist perspective because they feel overwhelmed by the majority of very brilliant secular scientists who hold to the theory of evolution. How would you encourage a, a Christian who's struggling with that? Yeah, that's a, uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's an error in logic. It's an appeal to majority or an appeal to authority. In this case, they're kind of combined. But uh, just because the majority of people believe something doesn't make it true. So appeals to authority are generally bad, but functionally, this particular appeal to authority is actually a very good argument because the fact that scientists globally assume evolutionary theory when doing a lot of their experiments and things like medicine and agriculture and then their predictions come to fruition with evolution as that assumption means that like we are constantly showing support for evolution. Every time it's assumed and the prediction comes to fruition, that's just another drop in the barrel for the support for evolutionary theory. So like, yeah, the number here does matter because it's scientists globally making the assumption of evolution. That assumption is, of course, incorrectly thought by Lyle to be due to indoctrination when really it's predicated, at least in the scientists that I know, on years, decades of study. And in fact, every scientific discovery that's ever been made has gone against what the majority believed. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been a discovery. It would have been a mere, merely a confirmation. Well, that's just not true. If I discover a new species of butterfly, how is that going against what the majority of scientists believe? Or if I discover a new disease, or if I figure out a new way to vacuum seal things. I think he's thinking of like revolutionary theories here, like how the theory of relativity sort of related to Newton's theories with relation to physics beforehand, or evolution with biology and species fixity. And by the way, I've had enough conversation with scientists. This this would this would surprise most uh, non-scientists, but most scientists, if you ask them why they believe in evolution, 
will say it's because all the other scientists believe in evolution. <laughs> So, okay, so we can always find someone who says uh, they kind of lean on authority. But what mm -hmm. about the people who are the actual workers in the specific field who are not just punting to say, well, this guy said this. They've actually done, you know, we say they've done the work, so to speak, right? Um, how mm -hmm. would we engage with someone like that who says, here, evolution is true because, and they kind of give some of the specific uh, points that they believe to be evidence for their position. Oh, Eli, we'll find out more about what he would say to a person like that later. I heard some stuff that, that you were saying in that interview that I would staunchly disagree with, and I would kind of like to hash that out with you if that's all right. And so the, the, uh, the two main fields where they would say, well, we think we have evidence for evolution would be either genetics or fossil evidence. Okay. So those would be the areas that we'll probably want to focus in on. I mean, biogeography, statistics, medicine, agriculture. We can stick with these two, though. That's probably for the best. Can you pretend for just a few moments to be a naturalistic evolutionist and lay out the strongest case that they make for their position so that we can create um, a steel man, and then you can put your, your, your feet back in the, the Christian shoes and refute the straw man? Lyle starts off by doing an okay job with this. He goes on to go into the specifics of the arguments that would be made, and he starts with this one. One of the arguments they would make is they would make an argument based on similarity, taxonomy, the fact that we can ta that we can classify organisms, okay. and they fall into a nested hierarchy. So we know a hierarchy, you know, this, you know, these these two things belong to this, and this and this belong to this, and so on. And there's a hierarchy within a hierarchy, so it's a nested hierarchy. See, this is good. Um, you know, so you can classify uh, humans, you know, we're in, we're in the, you know, the, you know, the kingdom phylum class order family genus species, you know, so we're, we're in the primates and we're in the mammals and we're in the vertebrates and so on. Yeah. And they would say that that's what we would expect if life evolved from a, a common organism, you'd expect to be able to classify it that way. This is even better. At least we know that Lyle accepts that morphologically humans are primates, mammals, etc. And then I think they would further, they would further try to argue, they would say that um, not only is it true in terms of physical traits, but genetically. Genetically, we're more similar to, say, a chimpanzee than um, a lizard, and, and more similar to a lizard than a fruit fly, for example. And so they, they would say that genetics, the genetic code, also falls into a, a, a nested hierarchy. Right. And so that, they would say that that then is support of common descent. So that's where they would take it on terms of the genetics, I think. Yeah, absolutely. We should see the nested hierarchy both in morphology and in the genomes. We should see organisms nest, respectively, in larger and larger groups moving upwards or more and more specific groups moving downward on taxonomic rank. He did leave one important thing out here, which is that organisms are nested in their genetics, yes, but specifically they are nested in both functional and non-functional regions. The fact that they're nested in the latter portion falsifies the idea that it's common design, not common descent. Because unless God is just being very tricky, I don't see any reason that's been put forward by intelligent design advocates for there to be a nested hierarchy in the functional regions, which would be in accordance with design, and the non-functional regions, which should not be correlated at all because they don't do anything. And they might make some specific cases like the, um, the supposed uh, chromosome 2 fusion that happens. Ooh, uh-oh. Supposed, Dr. Lyle? Yeah, one specific example is they'd say that, you know, because we're supposed to be related to the great apes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so apes have um, uh, 24 pairs of chromosomes. Human beings have 23. Okay. And so uh, at some point, what, we lost a chromosome. What happened there? And so they've, they've claimed that what happened is in, in – because uh, they think that the thing we're descended from would have a genome similar to a, a chimpanzee. That okay. They think that's probably our nearest living relative. And they would say that the chromosomes 12 and 13 on the chimpanzee fused. You see, so two of the chromosomes came together. And there are certain segments in our chromosome 2 that, that kind of line up with, uh, with the chimpanzee's chromosomes. They've actually renamed them chromosome 2A and 2B in chimpanzees because of the alleged similarity to okay. the chromosome 2. So that's one specific example that they would make. Ooh, Dr. Lyle, this is a big L on your part. I would have expected you to be one of the individuals who's like, yeah, sure, maybe there was a fusion, but it's after the fall of Adam and Eve or whatever. It is pretty inarguable at this point that a fusion occurred, and you need look no further than the fact that creationist organizations spend a lot of time trying to fight it. 
I did an entire video on this, but here's the brass tacks really quickly. Humans have 46 chromosomes and other apes have 48 chromosomes. So that's 23 versus 24 pairs respectively. In humans, long ago when this was first figured out, scientists realized that we had one fewer pair of chromosomes than the other apes, and they made a prediction that a fusion had occurred at human chromosome 2 between the ancestral chromosomes 12 and 13, or as Lyle Harris called it, 2a and 2b in the ancestral chromosome that chimpanzees still carry today. Chromosomes are tightly wound packages of genetic information with a centromere in the middle and telomeres at each of the ends of the four arms. It is at the ends of these four arms in the telomere areas where you get what's called a head-to-head -head fusion, telomere to telomere. So chromosomes, if you know something goes wrong, can end up fused together. This is something that we've seen in other species, a head-to-head telomere-telomere -head fusion. So that initial prediction was made all the way back in 1972, 1973 by Trelo and Grouchy, and this set up a very simple predictions for scientists to effectively make before the technology would catch up and we could actually get a nice karyotype and a nice genomic sequence of human chromosome 2 that we could then compare to chimp chromosome 2a and 2b, or at the time 12 and 13. One, Telomeres, those little caps at the ends of these chromosomes, have very specific repeated sequences. So your DNA has a lot of different letters and letter combinations. You can have A's, T's, G's, and C's, and they come in a myriad of different combos that create your genome. Now, at the ends of these telomeres, there's a very specific sequence that repeats over and over and over and over and over again. And we only find these repeats in this density at the telomeres. So the prediction was very simple. We should find a lot of telomeric repeats in the middle of human chromosome 2 where the fusion site would have been purported to occur. And they should occur in two ways. They should be forward at the end of one chromosome and backward at the beginning of the other. If there was a fusion site, there should also be two centromeres, a normal centromere and a cryptic centromere. And fortunately, centromeres also have repeated sequences. They're called alphoid repeats. And lastly, if there was in fact a fusion event, then chimpanzees chromosomes 12 and 13 should be very similar to human chromosome 2 in the rest of the structure and identity. In 2002, Fauna and colleagues sequenced this area and showed every single prediction to be true in wondrous detail. Subsequent papers investigated it even further and it were able to come up with like a step-by-step -step process of how this event actually had occurred on the basis of like the genetic signatures within the fusion site and within the ancestral chromosomes. And so like this was the end of the case. This was case closed for conventional science. Young Earth creationists fought back against this and argued that no, no, there's actually a functional gene spanning the fusion site. So it can't actually be a fusion site. And like, you guys want to know what the gene is? It's a gene called DDX11L2, which is a part of the DDX11L family, of which every other pseudogene in the family is found exclusively at telomeres. Not only that, but there is no known function for this thing. It is sometimes transcribed, but that's pretty much it. And I go into a lot greater detail on all of this over in my Human Chromosome 2 video. We talk about satellite DNA, we talk about how head-to-head -head fusions happen, we talk about all the typical objections that younger creationists tend to propose. So yes, the case is closed, and no, Lyle does not go back and talk about this at all. This is the last we really hear about it in this video, and so I don't really know what to tell you guys. I just felt a duty to talk about it anyways, in case Lyle ever watches this. That's in terms of genetics, and then in terms of fossil evidence, they would have, they would have to do a little more hand-waving, but they would say that there are certain um, transitional features, and this would primarily be coming from people who, have not, who are not experts on paleoanthropology but they would say that there is uh, quite a range in terms of the different fossils that we find of human beings, which is true. And they would try to make a case that we go from an ape, a more ape-like form to a more human-like form. We all understand what he means here, but it is worth noting that this is like saying that a dog in its domestication process went from a more canine-like form to a more dog-like form. Humans are still apes. We're still hominoids, we're still hominids, and of course we're still hominins. And we aren't all of these things just because of evolutionary theory, how common descent works, how the law of monophyly works, how organisms change and adapt to their environments over time. We're also all of these things just because of the morphologic and genetic characteristics that we have today. This is how Linnaeus, who was a creationist, 
grouped the apes. He, of course, put the other apes in with humans. He, he sort of raised them up instead of pushing us down, as it were. But Linnaeus recognized the similarity here. We have all the characteristics that apes have, and thus we are apes. There is no getting around this. And I think it's high time that more creationists just accepted this to be the case. Uh, I've studied the fossils enough to know they're going to have a tough time making that case. I know this is a stream about the Big Bang, so if you would rather talk about that, I certainly also have questions on your anisotropic model um, that I could ask. So it's really up to you and the hosts on what we want to discuss here. I'm happy to try and answer the the uh, questions on hominids. Now, I'm not an expert in that area. My, my PhD is in astrophysics, but um, if I don't know, I'll just say I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I think that's super fair. Is my foreshadowing on the nose enough for you? But that's, that's what they would argue. And then they would do that. They would say, well, maybe we haven't found all the missing links. But nonetheless, in broad strokes, um, there are certain organisms that, because of this nested hierarchy, you, you can find that in the fossil record, too. And so they would, and we tend to find certain organisms below other organisms. Uh, statistically, if you find a, a trilobite, it's likely going to be in a lower layer than, for example, a bird, uh, as, just, as just one example. So uh, there's, a, there's a statistical order. And they would say that represents time. That represents millions of years mm -hmm. of organisms. And we see that they change as you go up. So there you go, evolution in action. Um, no, full stop. It is not a statistical thing. Every single trilobite is below every single bird, period. There is zero exception to this rule. This is because trilobites went extinct 251 million years ago during the Permian mass extinction, and birds are still around today, and they evolved in, like, the mid-Jurassic. They talk briefly, or at least Lyle mentions briefly, how he feels like a lot of evolutionists fall back on philosophy. And then they talk about theistic evolutionists for like just a second, and Lyle kind of promotes the idea that even though they're still theistic, they are practicing methodological naturalism by not allowing or pretending that God doesn't exist when they're doing their science. And like, I would really like to ask Lyle, do you think that they should? Do you think that they should just allow for miracles when you're performing every single chemical reaction in the lab? Lyle even says the reason they do this is because you'll never know if you're finding out something new about the natural world or if God's just messing with you. But then he doesn't really elaborate on that point, which is very strange. There are some who would say, well, I believe in God, God exists, but we can't bring him into the equation. When we do science, and they would say, because you'd never know if you were discovering something about the universe or, or if God's just messing with you, right? So you, you right. have to pretend that God doesn't exist when you do your science. So they would embrace methodological naturalism right. and in some cases empiricism. Again, he briefly asserts that like people will fall back on philosophy and like, I don't really care about philosophy. I care about the data. I care about how theories hash out in their sort of predictive ability, the accuracy of those predictions through time. How do they stand up to scrutiny through time over the past, well, I don't know, 150 years or so. Kind of feels like there's a theory that matches that, huh? But I just can't put my finger on it. He goes on to talk about, again, like when you ask scientists what they think the best evidence for evolution is, it depends on whether or not they're a geneticist or a paleontologist, because they'll say whatever field that they don't work in is the best evidence for evolution. What is that evidence that they appeal to? Not to say that it's legitimate evidence because we understand the importance of interpretation of the data, but what is the specific thing in the area of fossils that everyone says, look, it's right here, man. What's your problem? Thank you, Eli. I think this is a really good question. And I would say the correct answer is all of the hominins that span the past 7 million years of time whose morphology show the slow morphologic change going from a basal Miocene ape to modern members of genus Homo, such as Homo sapiens, or moving backwards a few hundred thousand years in time, the likes of Homo neanderthalensis, Denisovans, Homo naledi, and Homo floresiensis. Well, with regard to human evolution, there are certain... Um... We, we, we find about something on the order of 8,000 remains of humans or creatures that look like they're human anyway. Okay. And, uh, and they would say that there is a progression, that, that some are more ape-like like, and some are more like modern Homo sapiens. And there are a great many in the middle that don't fall cleanly into the basal-looking category or the derived-looking category. We'll be talking about those later. And I'm happy to talk about some of the details of that if you're interested, because uh, the, the, the most common view now is that uh, Lucy, which is an Australopithecus, Australopithecus afarensis. <sighs> I really want to bust him for this. I really do. I want to dunk on him for it. I want to put like a funny meme right here. But later in this video, Lyle does say something along the lines of, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing some of these names. So it's like, yes, you are, but at least you know that that's a possibility. 
For the record, it is Australopithecus, not Australiapithecus. <sighs> it's just like he agreed to do this, a, a video that's titled like, is human evolution viable? That's what the thumbnail says. So like, it might be a wise idea knowing that you're going into this type of video to like brush up on how to say the names. That's all I'll say. That's supposed to be uh, a human ancestor. And that's supposed okay. to be evolved into Homo habilis. And that's supposed to be evolved into uh, Homo erectus and then um, Heidelberg man and then the branched off and then the Neanderthals. They used to think Neanderthals perhaps were ancestor, but I don't think anybody believes that anymore, that they mm -hmm. think that that's probably a separate uh, shoot. This is a very simplistic outline of one potential idea for some of the ancestor descendant relationships. If a bit of a crude one, especially like bringing up Heidelbergensis, that tends to at least right now in the literature not be very popular of a name to use. Homo habilis being directly descendant from Australopithecus afarensis, like maybe, I don't know. Homo erectus, it depends on if you mean sensu stricto or sensu lato, right? Um, and of course, it's not just Neanderthals and Homo sapiens that descend from Homo erectus, it's a great many more hominins indeed. Um, he is right, like no one thinks that humans descended from Homo neanderthalensis, and the reason for this is because we have their genome. And in fact, we have several genomes of several different individuals, something on the order of like two dozen, maybe, maybe a little bit less than that. Uh, but what that also means is that we know that they didn't descend from us, which if Lyle is holding to any of the answers in Genesis or Institute for Creation Research ideas, they propose that Neanderthals are like degenerate humans, like from post-fall of Adam and Eve, but like that cannot be the case. But uh, with the exception of the first two, Australopithecus, the Lucy, and Homo habilis, which I, I, I think is kind of a, a junk taxon. It has some... A, a, okay fragments of apes in it, some fragments of humans, and you, you get a new, it really is an ape man, but it, it never existed. If you see what I'm saying, it's parts from both. This argument is incredibly insulting and very much absolute nonsense. A lot of the reason why Homo habilis is seated between the late Australopiths and things like Homo rudolfensis and Homo erectus is because of the cranial morphology, the morphology of the skull and of the face. Now tell me, Dr. Lyle, how do you get a mix of human and ape bones in a skull? This is an argument that originated in Bones of Contention and has been carried forward into the spiritual successor of that Young Earth Creationist book, a book titled Contested Bones, which I've been going through sentence by sentence on my Library of Errors series here on YouTube. But like the bottom line is a lot of the hominins that they're accusing of being chimeric, so a mix of quote-unquote ape bones and human bones, really what they're saying is non-human ape bones and human bones, a lot of those guys have bones that are in articulation with one another, one. And two, a lot of the transitional species, again, are skulls. They cannot, they're found in a single piece, you guys. Like, they, they can't be a mix of two bones unless, I don't know, you want to suggest that you know, the classic example I use is you've got an Australopith and Homo sapiens and they're running at top speed against one another, but this time, instead of crashing together and their bones just happen to be in articulation, they crash together and their skulls quantum tunnel in such a way as to make it look like the skull belonged to a real organism. And the reason I'm saying that most of the transitionals here are skulls is because by the time we reach this point in human evolution, the late Australopith, early Homo stage, everything's already bipedal. We know this because we do in fact have several skeletons of australopiths that have the bowl-shaped pelvis, they have the valgus knee, they have the anterior foramen magnum, they have the inline big toe, they have the three arches. Australopithecus africanus, we see this in Australopithecus afarensis, we see it partially in Ardipithecus raminus 4.4 million years ago, earlier than both of these species. So once you've got something that's already bipedal, one, you can make the bipedality a little bit more efficient, that's true, but a lot of the big changes are going on in the face and in the skull, flattening out the face, more parabolic palate, uh, increasing the brow ridge, weirdly enough, for kind of the middle to late genus Homo, and of course, getting a bigger brain and all of the morphology that goes along with that, the big globular skull. Um, but primarily non-humans, primarily non-humans in the Homo habilis. Uh, the other ones, Homo erectus, um, uh, Heidel, Homo Heidel, Heidelbergensis, uh, those are all humans. And I, I, I'm, I'm impressed that you could pronounce all this. It sounds like you're speaking in tongues, well, man. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm sorry, boys. I simply can't be that jovial with such incorrect statements being made with such a blasé attitude. Because you see, Homo erectus is not as Dr. Lyle here has characterized it. I don't know if he thinks we've only got like one skull or one skeleton or what, but Homo erectus is like one of the most variable hominins, 
period. If we're looking at it Senzuleto, which given he doesn't mention any of the potential species that Homo erectus could be sort of parsed out, separated out into, I'm assuming he is sort of appreciating it in its Senzuleto in a broad sense term, um, well, I don't think you can make the case that they're clearly human, given some of them have overlap in brain case size with australopiths, and some of them have a facial morphology that is more similar to Homo habilis. We're gonna get to this, we're gonna get to the specifics, but the really important point that Dr. Lyle and no creationist I've ever seen appreciates, none of them, is that there is a massive amount of morphologic overlap in these hominins, in late Australopithecus into early genus Homo with Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, Homo georgicus, if we're going to do what I prefer, which is separate out Homo erectus a little bit more, Homo ergaster, and yes, some members of Homo erectus. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a paleoanthropologist. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing them correctly. So it's it. all right. You can fool okay. me. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. At least he knows it. And I don't know that it's a huge feat to be able to fool Eli on these things. Uh, the, the good news is I know people who are experts um, yeah. on either human anatomy. Dave, David Menton, he passed away last year. He's a good friend of mine. He's an expert on human anatomy and ape anatomy. Mm. Yeah, he, was, he, he taught me how to, how to see the differences and so on. And I have read other, other works as well. Uh, mm. Dr. Uh, Martin, Marvin, pardon me, Dr. Marvin Lubenow, who's got a book called Bones of Contention. This, oh, this is a great somewhere. resource. And it is, um, I've never met um, Professor Lubenow, but he's... Um, He's really done his homework in terms of the fossil evidence. So this is the spiritual successor to that book, right? It is described as building upon that book, which was published in 1992, which explains why Lyle seems to not be like super aware of hominins that have been discovered since 1992, but we'll get there. Um, this thing does not have very many correct sentences in it, in the whole thing, right? And if you don't believe me, you can go watch my series on that and we do go through it almost sentence by sentence we only go through the sentences that are wrong and you can see how long that takes uh mm -hmm. and so so all of these homo erectus um homer neanderthalus they, they really all should be classified as homo sapiens and if they want to put a subspecies after it, that's okay that, that these would basically be different ethnicities of human so beings you, so one friendly correction it's homo neanderthalensis um and two on the ethnicities thing that's a very strange thing to say, Dr. Lyle. Now, the Neanderthals, those are human beings, and most most people recognize that. Now, there has been a recent push back to say, well, they're they're a different species, but nonetheless, they had they buried their dead. They had they had culture. Um, you know, burial of the dead is is an indication that you expect to be resurrected. So that's an indication that they had religion. Whether they had knowledge of the true religion, we don't know. But um, these are human beings. There's evidence that they interbred with what we what we call modern uh, Homo sapiens, okay. and uh, they lived at the same time. So they, they can't be an ancestor because they lived at the same time. So that that is pretty sure. well shot down any any uh, chance of them being an, an ancestor. But most uh, most paleoanthropologists would say, no, these are people. These are these are human beings. Whether they want to put them in as a different species of humans, I think is a bad idea. But so the recent pushback is because the Neanderthal genome has been sequenced, and it is only ninety nine point seven percent similar to Homo sapiens today. All humans are ninety nine point nine percent similar to one another, so they fall outside of the range of modern humans. That's why they're considered to be a separate species. Now, Lyle conflates a lot of terms here. He conflates human and human being and Homo sapiens. These are different things. I would propose that anything in genus Homo is human. Homo means human. So yes, I, I would say Homo habilis is human. I would say Homo ergaster is human. I would classify them all as human. But Homo sapiens, absolutely not. Neanderthals have their own unique suite of morphologic characteristics. And absolutely, Neanderthals did a lot of the same things humans did. We did interbreed with them. They interbred with Denisovans, Denisovans with humans. It was just a free-for-all back then, and likely that's why there was so much cultural exchange going on. But like, it's kind of interesting that he points out burial of the dead because Homo naledi was doing that as well. Homo naledi, an organism, a hominin, with a 600cc brain case size that looked very similar to an Australopith in some aspects of its face, of its arms, and in its hands. Um, but many of them classified as Homo sapiens, Neander Neanderthal, Asus or whatever it is, but the, yeah, mm -hmm. so it's a subspecies. But they have all the characteristics of humans. Okay. And what are the characteristics of humans? Well, humans differ from apes in terms of our skeletal features, because that's usually all that, that we can find is the skeleton. No, actually, they're lacking the two main characteristics that classify Homo sapiens, that being the globular shape of the skull. Neanderthalensis has a platycephalic skull, or Neanderthalasis, or whatever Lyle said. And they also lack a chin. 
They don't have the bony protuberance that Homo sapiens has. Now, they also, importantly here, have their own derived characteristics that Homo sapiens doesn't have, to the exclusion of Homo sapiens. So there are things that Neanderthals have that we lack. They have a retromolar gap, so this is a gap behind the last molar. They have an occipital bun on the back of their skull. Again, they have that platycephalic sloping shape to their skull. They have a large nasal aperture. These guys are their own thing. And even then, you know, I talk about 8,000 human remains that could be that could be a tooth. Okay, the idea that, you know, rarely do we find a complete, fully articulated skeleton. We do find some, and Neanderthals are one of the most common that we find. We think that they lived uh, shortly after the flood year during the Ice Age, which we believe was produced by the Genesis Flood. Okay, so let's talk about them as well. Ardipithecus ramidus, Australopithecus afarensis, more than once, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus sediba, Homo ergaster, Homo neanderthalensis, and these are just the species that I can think of that have, like, once you reflect across the midline, like over 50% of the skeleton as far as the species' general architecture. There are a litany of other remains for each of the species I just mentioned, and indeed many more, and that allows us to cross-check the anatomy of the skeletons themselves. So if you have a knee or a partial knee from one member of Australopithecus, you can cross-check it with another knee, which is what we do. The Australopithecus afarensis knee is identical to the Australopithecus sediba knee. And wouldn't you know it, they're both of bipeds. But their characteristics are human and not simian, not ape. Uh, the characteristics of an ape several. Let's just talk about the skull. They, apes tend to have a smaller cranial capacity, although that's not definitive because the range of, of your head size for human beings is like a factor of three. It's like 700 cubic centimeters to like 2100 cubic centimeters. So there's a range in human beings even today. Well, that's interesting because Homo habilis gets down as low as 500 cc's for its brain case size, and it gets as high as into the 700s. So is it a human or is it not, right? Homo erectus gets down to 546 cc's. In fact, the entire Dimenisi specimens stay below 800 cc's. So where do they fall? Especially since the majority of them actually fall below 700 cc's. What about certain members of Homo ergaster? What about Homo naledi at 600 cc's? What about Homo floresiensis at around 450 cc's? Now, what Lyle is gonna say is, well, it's not just the brain case size, it's other things too. So yeah, I would agree. Let's also assess those characteristics. And uh, Neanderthals fall in that range. Their average cranial capacity is larger than ours by about 10%. They had bigger brains than we do, which yeah. is I think, uh, kind of interesting. Uh, but their head shape was a little different because they tended yeah. to have the, the back portion of their skull was a little bit longer and they had kind of like a, like a bun almost on, on their, on their skull in the back. And, mm. and that's a little different from some of the other uh, groups that we see. So, yeah. but brain size, Neanderthals are human. Um, the way the face is shaped, we have a kind of a flat face. If you look at it from the side, you know, from the top, you know, our face is kind of flat, whereas an apes is kind of, kind of pushes forward their, their jaws go forward. Yeah. Oh, so it's relative prognathism in addition to brain case size that tells us what a human is. Okay. So here's a chimpanzee. It's pretty prognathic, pretty snouty. Uh, here's a Neanderthal. Who's snoutier? Which one's snoutier? Because they're both really prognathic, aren't they? Well, okay. Well, maybe then Neanderthals are, are a little bit not human. Okay, well, what about Homo habilis? Because Homo habilis is significantly flatter than a chimpanzee. It's the fact that it's, its face is significantly flatter than Neanderthals. What about Homo rudolfensis, whose face is flatter than both Neanderthalensis, chimpanzees, and also Homo habilis. Let's just take a little comparison look here, a little comparative anatomy to, to take a little peek here. Huh? Who's got the more prognathic face? Who's, who's got the flatter face? Now, generally speaking across human evolution, faces do get flatter, they get more orthognathic. So looking at Homo erectus here, a specimen of Homo erectus, late Homo erectus, peaking man, um, and over here is Homo habilis, and like they're both pretty similar in their prognathism. Um, there's different types of prognathism as well with like alveolar prognathism, which is more like kind of the lower portion of the face. But for whatever reason, Neanderthals seem to kind of get a little prognathic again. Um, I believe it's been proposed that their Neanderthals might have been cold adapted. Now I'm not sure what being a little bit more prognathic would have to do with that. I don't tend to focus on the later hominins, but the point remains that no, it doesn't seem like prognathism is, prognathism is actually a good means by which to determine who, who is human and who is ape. Like, it may be that Homo rudolfensis is not directly on the human lineage, and it's just a weird offshoot with kind of a weirdly flat face. Prognathism just seems to be a bit more of a plastic character than has been traditionally assumed, despite general trends. 
Uh, one really distinctive feature is this, uh, the top part of your nose. The lower part of your nose is cartilage. The top part is bone. Apes do not have this. Humans do. And so I can tell you immediately when looking at a skull, if, if this part, see, sometimes part of the skull is missing and you don't, you don't know. Okay. But if, the, if the skull's there, I can tell you if it's human or ape, just I look at this and I remember apes can't wear glasses. That's how you remember that. <laughs> so do they look like this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have this. They don't have this bridge right here. And so, and see, I have a fairly long one, which indicates I'm far more evolved than, than most people. <laughs> so that's how it works. That's going to be a tough sell, Dr. Lyle, because some members of Homo erectus sensu like they'll have prominent nasal bones, like the kind that would allow you to wear glasses, and some don't. So are those ones not human? Some of them have pretty, pretty big brains. I mean, I was just eyeballing my Sailanthropus cast and like it's got kind of a convex nasal bone itself which is interesting. It, it suggests that it might be a bit more of a plastic trait as well, given most other hominins that you know, like immediately come after Sailanthropus chinensis in the next few million years, things like Ardipithecus and Australopithecus, they don't have a prominent nasal bone. And then it seems to come back sometime after Homo habilis in Homo erectus sensuleto, but not all members of Homo erectus have it. Um, the way our teeth is is different. Apes have huge molars and human beings have relatively small molars. So here's a chimpanzee. And here's a human. Chimp molars are a touch bigger, nothing to write home about, but yeah, a little bit bigger, sure. Here's Neanderthals, human, just like uh, Lyle said, except, uh-oh, those molars are kind of starting to look like they're the same size, aren't they? Here's Homo erectus. Wow, Homo erectus has bigger molars than this chimpanzee. Interesting, so I guess Homo erectus is an ape, like an ape in the way Lyle thinks it's an ape, like in the wrong way. The shape that our teeth makes is different. Human beings, it's like a parabola, whereas with apes, it's like a U where it becomes parallel on the sides. And so you can tell by the by the shape of the teeth, whether it's human and the type of teeth that you find, whether it's human or not. And that's just yeah. the skull. Parabolic palate, sure, let's talk about that. So here's the human palate, very parabolic. And here's the chimpanzee palate, very rectangular. Okay, cool, so that's chimpanzee. Now let's compare the human and Homo erectus. Well, that's pretty parabolic, kind of not parabolic, a little bit more rectangular. Okay, let's try uh, Australopithecus. Well, that's a little bit more rectangular, right? Well, wait a second. This kind of feels a little bit like it might be a spectrum. Now let's look at it in comparison to the chimpanzees. So here's the chimp, here's Australopithecus, right? Kind of similar. Australopithecus definitely has a more parabolic anterior dentition by the incisors. And here's the chimpanzee again, and here's Homo erectus. Well, uh-oh. Oh, it almost feels like you could line them up. Just for fun, though, here's Homo naledi, which I know that Answers in Genesis is deemed as ape and not human. And here's Homo habilis. Boy, this is kind of an interesting exercise, isn't it? It almost seems like you can see the palate growing more and more parabolic as we move from more basal to more derived. So, like... Where does early Homo erectus fall in this? Where does Homo naledi fall? Where does Homo habilis fall? We talk about the, the other features, the rib cage human beings. Our rib cage is kind of vertical on the side and then it curves at the top. Uh, apes have kind of a Christmas tree, a cone-shaped uh, rib cage. Uh, Lucy, cone-shaped, just typical ape. This took no time to find. This paper was published in 2020. It's titled Rib Cage Anatomy and Homo erectus suggests a recent evolutionary origin of modern human body shape. And we move down into the abstract, it says, the tall and narrow body shape of anatomically modern humans evolved via changes in the thorax, pelvis, and limbs. It is debated, however, whether these modifications first evolved together in African Homo erectus, so that would be like Homo ergaster, or whether Homo erectus has a more primitive body shape that was distinct from both the more ape-like Australopithecus species and Homo sapiens. Here we present the first quantitative three-dimensional reconstruction of the thorax of a juvenile Homo erectus skeleton. This is Narikotomi boy or Turkana boy, along with its estimated rib cage for full comparison with Homo sapiens and Kibara to Neanderthal. Our three-dimensional reconstruction demonstrates a short, medial, laterally widened and antero-posteriorly deep thorax in KMWT 15,000 that differs considerably from the much shallower thorax of Homo sapiens, pointing to a recent evolutionary origin of a fully modern human body shape. The large respiratory capacity of KMWT 15,000 is compatible with the relatively stocky, more primitive shape of Homo erectus. So, Dr. Lyle, um, Homo erectus, again, looks like it's hashing out as non human, isn't it? Uh, the way our hip bones are structured, they kind, of, they kind of point forward and that allows us to walk upright, whereas apes have them splayed out to the side, and Lucy's are splayed out to the side, just like any other ape. 
Not only is this not true in the case of Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, who, like other bipedal Australopiths, have the human condition of sagittally oriented iliac blades, which forms a bowl shape for the pelvis as compared to the coronally splayed ilia that we tend to see in knuckle-walking apes like chimpanzees, but this is also true for the pelvis of other Australopiths that we have, including Australopithecus sediba and Australopithecus africanus, as well as partially true as far as the earlier hominin Ardipithecus ramidus. In fact, I say this to Lyle later, but you literally cannot reconstruct Lucy's pelvis to be in a chimpanzee shape without adding hypothetical bone on the, um, on the ilium, ischium, and towards the pubis to stretch it downward. Otherwise, the pubis, pubic symphysis simply won't close. Um, the, uh, we tend to have longer legs relative to the rest of, you know, to our trunk than apes have. Uh, the angle at which our, our shoulders are designed, a lot of apes, especially if they're prime, if they are um, arboreal, like, like Lucy was. Lucy was a tree-dwelling primate. And right. so her shoulder bones are designed differently so that she can hang for a long period of time. Lucy certainly still spent some time in the trees, as evidenced by her curved phalanges, but given the entire suite of her postcrania besides the curved phalanges and the slightly altered orientation of the glenoid cavity, um, she's, she's a biped, full stop. She's got the valgus knee, she's got the bull-shaped pelvis, she has the anterior foramen magnum, and of course, she has the inline big toe and three arches in the foot. There is simply no debating this. No one debates this, that Lucy was bipedal when she came to the ground. The argument, as it was many moons ago with Stern and Sussman versus Lovejoy and colleagues, was how much time was she spending on the ground? No one said zero time, and even Stern and Sussman said, yeah, she was probably coming down quite frequently, if not spending the majority of the time there. And we have straight fingers, straight phalanges, whereas Lucy had curved uh, mm, phalanges, yeah. which is useful for, for climbing yeah. and, and things yeah. like that. So we have very different designs. Uh, our feet, our feet are designed for walking upright. Apes have often almost an opposable big toe. It's almost like a second set of hands, not quite, but uh, so, and Lucy's are typical. Very good for playing video games. Yeah, you play, you play two sets. You can play yourself one with these. <laughs> I forgot to mention this previously, but Lucy's proportions, the proportions of Australopithecus afarensis are actually more similar to humans than they are to chimpanzees. But like, yeah, she has curved and she's already said this. Absolutely true. No problems with that. The feet, absolutely not. Like just Full stop, that is not the case. We have the foot fossils. We have the fossil metacarpals. We have the fossil, um, some of the fossil tarsals of different hominins and of australopiths. And like, no, absolutely not. They had an inline big toe and three arches in the feet. We have their footprints. And again, we have representation of the feet from Australopithecus afarensis, Australopithecus africanus, and some from Australopithecus sediba as well. So those are just, those are some of the traits that, and when we look at um, Australopithecus, all the traits of an ape, 100%. Okay. The, the, the way the skull goes down, the lack of the, the nasal protrusion, the teeth, the way they're shaped, the mm -hmm. uh, rib cage, everything, the hip structure, the feet, everything is, is simian, yeah. everything is ape-like. Um, all these other categories, Neanderthals, Homo erectus, he Heidelberg man, um, and modern Homo sapiens, of course, mm. all have the human teeth, the human face, and so on. Yeah, so like we already went over, this is just boldly untrue. I don't know if Lyle is mistaken. I have reason to believe he's just mistaken, but... Yeah, like he, he is wrong here. Australopithecus afarensis does have curved phalanges. She is prognathic, that species is prognathic, and it doesn't have prominent nasal bones. However, its brain case is bigger than the hominins that came before, and this thing has every single characteristic of a biped. Full stop. This thing could not have biomechanically been a quadruped, and the fact that she was bipedal on the ground is not up for debate in the paleontological community. Now, moving forward to the other ones that are clearly human, I think we demonstrated by looking at some of the fossil specimens and some of my models that that is also not true. Homo erectus dips way down into the late Australopith, very early Homo range in a lot of characteristics, including the shape of the palate, the size of the teeth, the brain case size, the barrel shape of the chest. This is just not an argument that you can make. Now, the animals were a little different, uh, they had some differences, but they're all they're all within the range of modern humans. Well, they actually aren't. That's the entire point, is that their genome, when sequenced, was outside of the range of modern humans. And Lyle says this later, phenotype reflects genotype, doesn't it? All, all those features, by the way, modern human beings can have any of those. It's just what would be unusual today is to have all of them in one person. Okay. So Neanderthals, for example, tend to have a large uh, protrusion in their on their nose. They have, tend to have a recessed chin. Again, you'll get that People today will get that. It's just they don't tend to have all those traits combined. So they're unquestionably human. Everything about them, the, the skull, the um, spinal cord, the rib, rib cage, everything about them is 100% human. And so it is with, with um, Homo erectus and these other ones. Hmm.
Well, no, not unusual. It would be impossible. They would be a Neanderthal at that point. They would have the genetics to reflect those characteristics, those phenotypes. Now, like Neanderthals do have a suite of characteristics that aren't found in modern humans. And in fact, in any single part, like I can't think of an example of a modern human having a retromolar gap. I can't think of a single example of a modern human exhibiting a full occipital bun. I can't think of a single example of a modern human exhibiting no chin. It looks like people have no chin sometimes, but that bony protuberance is still always there, even in the people that look like they, you know, they've kind of got their the double chin thing going on where they're pulling it back. Um, people don't have nasal apertures as large as what we see in Neanderthals either. But the real punchline, the real joke of that last thing he said is that this also applies to Homo erectus. It just point blank doesn't. I think I've made a very, very fine, reasonable case for that. So Lyle goes on to talk about the Tompkins number after being prompted by the host Eli. The Tompkins number, for those of you who might not know, is you've probably heard that humans are 98.8% similar to chimpanzees. This is true in our coding base pairs. When we're looking at the whole genome, it falls to about 96%. Well, a young Earth creationist scientist named Jeffrey Tompkins, and I use the quotes not because I'm saying creationists can't be scientists, I'm saying Tompkins doesn't do a very good job. Tompkins comes up with this number that's like 80% similar. And I've gone over it all before in this video here, so check it out if you want to know all of the many, many reasons that Tompkins is incorrect and how he has leaned that number. And just as like a spoiler, if Tompkins were to perform his same methodology on humans, like one human genome to another, you're probably not going to get 99.9% .9 similar. You're probably going to get something like 94% similar. That it is a flaw in reasoning to assume that similarity even a nested hierarchy indicates common descent. Sure. Because a lot of things occur in a nested hierarchy and are not the result of common descent. Right. Um, I, I'm, in fact, I'm doing a series of articles on the website now uh, on, on particles, quantum, quantum particles and quantum physics. Okay. And they fall into certain families. There are leptons and there are exactly six types of leptons and so on. And then there are quarks and there are exactly six types of quarks. And these both fall under the category of fermions. And you can classify quantum particles in a taxonomic tree, just like you would organisms. And yet nobody, nobody argues that quantum particles gradually evolved over millions of years. I'm always shocked when someone as intelligent as Jason Lyle makes this argument. Jensen does it too. The whole, you can categorize cars, but that doesn't mean they're all related. They don't reproduce. Right? You can categorize humans within our own species based off of our relatedness and form a nested hierarchy within the species by categorizing genomes on how close they are to one another. This is what we do when we do a paternity test or like ancestry.com or something along those lines. It's the same exact process. So like, I know Lyle would agree with that. He would agree that you can determine some level of relatedness within a species. So where exactly does it stop? Now, obviously it's inappropriate to compare this to, you know, quantum particles as he's just done here because those things don't reproduce. They don't leave a trace of themselves in their descendants in such a way that you can actually trace it back through time, which is something again that we know Lyle accepts. And so a nested hierarchy just means, it, it, it can mean common descent, but it can also mean that, there, that the creator has some sense of, of logic and orderliness. Mm -hmm. And how do you tell the difference? How do you tell when it's common descent versus when God did it, right? Like this is this is the problem. This is why good scientists, the ones who you were dogging on earlier for utilizing methodological naturalism, this is why they do it. So you can actually parse out the natural world in a way that's consistent within itself and makes sense. If you think that nested hierarchies work to some degree, like within a species or within a genus or within a family, then you have to put up or shut up. You or another creationist has to show some kind of genetic break a spot where evolution simply cannot cross. You have to be able to, to like show some support for your idea that nested hierarchies can be implied by genetic relatedness, but not every nested hierarchy implies genetic relatedness. Wh where does it stop? Where's the line? And this, this would be my counter argument to the, to the evolutionary case that I made earlier. Okay. That we have this nested hierarchy. That's what creationists would expect too. And so if, if both models make the same prediction, you can't say, ah, and the prediction's right, therefore my model's true. Well, the other model right. makes exactly the same prediction. Where? Where? Where did creationism ever make that prediction? Because I'm pretty well read in the creationist literature going all the way back to like Whitcomb and Morris, and they have been dragged kicking and screaming into accepting even the smallest amount of change. Getting all the way up to the family level is like monumental compared to where they were at back in the 60s or the 70s. So like, show me where creationists predicted that, Lyle, because you of all people should understand that predictions, first of all, they have to be made before the experiment is done, 
before the results come through fruition. Otherwise, it's just accommodation. But second of all, they have to be accurate. So evolutionary theory made this prediction, these nested hierarchies, like back around Darwin, you know, 150 odd years ago, and then again with genetics with the modern synthesis. Where'd creationism do it? Where did, where'd they do it? Where'd they, where'd they make this prediction? I'd love to see that. If it seems like I'm getting irritable, it's because I am. Because, like, Lyle has a PhD. He should know better than this. This is this is stuff that we teach in, like, lab number one of the lab that, that I teach at a university, right? Like, introduction to the scientific method, how to tell hypotheses from facts, how to make predictions when they're viable, when they're not. So he briefly talks about genetic mutations and how, like, yeah, some can be beneficial. It just depends on the context and sometimes... What's beneficial in one context, if you place the organism back in the context prior to its adaptation to the new environment, it will perform worse than the original population. Like, yeah, it's, this is basic stuff. At least he understands fitness. This is better than what we see from uh, Sanford and the like, which they, they have to change the definition of fitness to make genetic entropy work. It's like a whole thing. That's a whole other bag of worms. But then he goes on to discuss like getting new information. Like, yeah, there can be beneficial mutations, but it's always a loss of information and you can't get a microbe to a person doing that. But like, yeah, you can, right? You just need a duplication event and then point mutations or large scale mutational events on that duplicated portion of the genome. There was like a great series of papers studying this exact thing in de novo protein, like evolving in a population of ice fishes. And the protein actually gave their blood an antifreeze quality, which I would say is pretty beneficial. And also like the duplication event was from non-coding DNA. So it was a functionless section of DNA that gained a massively beneficial function and then proliferated within the population. So I'll put a link in the description to that, but like case in point, like yes, this happens and it happens like not infrequently. So then Eli asks Lyle to give like an argument to like his best argument as if he's talking to like an evolutionist professor or something along those lines. And Lyle does like the Darth Dawkins thing, right? Like a total roundabout way of being like, well, how do you know where knowledge comes from? How do you know you can trust yourself? It's just pre-sup apologetics, which again, I think is a bad way of arguing. I don't find it convincing. And like my presuppositions are like yours minus one Lyle. So it's not exactly impressive to me that you can make another presupposition as opposed to me. I can just say, I don't know, like I'm, I'm okay with that. And like worse yet for you, that doesn't help you with the theistic evolutionists or people of other faiths, now does it? Don't get me wrong, I'm happy to talk about the details of science, but you see a lot of people think that the way you reason with somebody like that is you give them all kinds of scientific evidence. Mm. But if, if in the situation you're talking about, you're talking about a, a science professor who has studied a lot of the evidence, which, me, which tells me he probably knows a lot of the evidence. The one thing he doesn't need is more evidence. He, he, he knows that. And he, sh and he should be a Christian. He should be a consistent biblical creationist Christian. He's not. Why? Is it because he doesn't know enough evidence? Probably not. If he's mm -hmm. a professor on that topic, he probably knows a lot of the evidence. The problem is his philosophy. He's interpreting it wrong. And he hasn't thought through the fact that his own philosophy is self-defeating, that if it were true, science wouldn't be possible. It wouldn't make sense to trust our senses if they're just the product of evolution. He says, well, our senses conveyed survival value. You know, you don't know that. I mean, it could be that our, our sensory experiences are simply a byproduct of photosynthesis. How do you know you're not a blade of grass and all your sensory perceptions are just the byproduct of photosynthesis and photosynthesis sure. does have survival value. So you see it's, but that's just kind of this, all what you think is reality just goes along with it. How do you know that? Mm -hmm. And a consistent evolutionist cannot answer that question because there, there isn't an answer apart from the Christian worldview. But Lyle, I just presuppose that I can trust my senses and I presuppose that the world around me operates in some general condition that is consistent within itself. You presuppose those things too, but then you just presuppose additionally that God made it that way. And I say, I don't know. I said this earlier, but like, again, underscore, 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 how does that help you like argue for Christianity specifically and not just Christianity, your version of it. That doesn't help you with the theistic evolutionists or the Muslims or the Hindus or any of those people because they all have their presuppositions as well. They're just different than yours. And I'm glad you said that you're willing to go into the evidence because I know critics of presuppositionalism will often say something to the effect that uh, presuppositional methodology is for the intellectually lazy. You guys don't want to dig into the weeds of the data. You're, you know, you're going over, and it's so ridiculous. We just recognize that it's useless in endlessly debating the data points. Yeah, we can debate them, and they're important. But I mean, the person's soul is at stake. I'm not going to debate for five hours, uh, you know, about genetics, you know, just so that the person could interpret the data in light of their presuppositions, and then we're right back at square one. So it's not intellectually lazy, really. I think it's intellectually deep. Okay. 
Personally, I think presuppositionalism is lazy. I think people use presuppositionalism because they can't back up their actual arguments with data. And if, you know, you want to call me an empiricist or whatever for that, sure. I don't mind that. But, like, I, that's all I'm interested in. I My presuppositions, I feel like, are reasonable. So take that how you will. If he wants to talk about fossils, I'm very happy to talk about those because those are very consistent with creation, especially when it regards to human evolution. The the picture, you know, of the chimp and the large, like you have on the, you know, on the on the around the window there, that that parade, the evolution parade of right. getting bigger, you know, more human. The only place you'll find that is in textbooks. You will not find that in the fossil record. And knowledgeable evolutionists know that. Yeah, the march of progress is super outdated. Evolution isn't linear and antigenetic like that. The human evolutionary tree is a big, bushy, beautiful story that involves a lot of different hominins successfully being human in a lot of different ways and successfully approaching being human, as in genus Homo, in different ways. But like, as far as does the fossil record support human evolution, unambiguously, yes. Pick any characteristic that modern humans have, like any morphologic characteristic, and I can show you how it appears through geologic time across the past 7 million years over the course of hominin evolution. Big brains, bipedality, dexterous hands, our dentition, name your price. But ultimately, I want to go for the Achilles heel and point out that um, all of his other uh, assumptions that he makes in terms of the reliability of science mm -hmm. depend on a creation outlook. They depend on the Bible being true and God being who the Bible says he is. <laughs> and so that's that's always what I'm going to go for. I'm always going to be presuppositional in my response. I'm happy to use evidence and talk about it, but more as a door opener than anything else, more to sure. get him thinking about things. So this makes a lot of sense as to why Lyle is an astrophysicist and a young earth creationist. I know I said that it was cognitive dissonance, like the last video that I made on Lyle, and I still hold that to be the case, but that works in tandem with his presuppositional upbringing. He assumes that he is correct in his interpretation of the Bible, and so he he simply must force fit, force accommodate all the data to somehow work with that. Anyways, I had a lot of problems with Lyle's representation of the hominin fossil record, and um, I did catch him on a show. We caught him on um, uh, Apologetics Live, so I thought it would be fun to drop in and have a chat with him, uh, specifically about Lucy and the bipedality of Lucy and the reconstructions of her and all of these different things. I didn't have very much time. I would have loved to get into a lot more. But keeping in mind how much he's talked about here, about how he loves to talk about the fossils and he's happy to talk about the fossils, um, let's have a conversation about the fossils and see how he responds to having a conversation with someone who does know the fossils and who's being formally trained in the fossils, in evolutionary theory, in primatology, etc. Now I will tell you that I'm very polite in this conversation. I don't dislike Lyle, I really don't. I think, I feel bad for him. I think that he's in a very weird state in order to be able to believe the things that he believes and also simultaneously try, try to stay plugged in to things like astronomy and astrophysics. And since he has clearly an interest in science, all of the other topics that he finds to be fascinating. So I do feel for him there. The hosts of this show, of Apologetics Live, are interesting. From from God's perspective, they're, women are the weaker vessel. Yeah, women be shopping. And, and we don't have time to get into what all that means, but uh, but that can be seen easily. It can, it, not only physically, but it can be seen emotionally. Um, when you talk to somebody long enough and see how they are, how they act, how they respond <clears throat> to life, I'm sorry, can I just clarify there? Women are the weaker vessel physically and emotionally? Yeah. Well, I'm not really 100% sure what that means. Anyways, it's mostly a conversation between me and Lyle, and they try to do some precept stuff at the end, but um, we're going to skip that. We're just going to enjoy the bits where we talk about the data. I heard some stuff that, that you were saying in that interview that I would staunchly disagree with, and I would kind of like to hash that out with you if that's all right. All right. Um, I know this is a stream about the Big Bang, so if you would rather talk about that, I certainly also have questions on your anisotropic model um, that I could ask. So it's really up to you and the hosts on what we want to discuss here. I'm happy to try and answer the the uh, questions on hominids. Now, I'm not an expert in that area. My, my PhD is in astrophysics, but um, if I don't know, I'll just say I don't know, okay? Yeah, I think that's super fair. All right. Um, so I, I found it very interesting that, that you made the case that uh, Australopithecus afarensis and indeed other Australopiths are um, non-bipedal. Uh, how would you back that up? Their hip structure is not designed. Our hip structure, the way it points forward, theirs is splayed out to the side, uh, a bit like a chimpanzee. Um, their phalanges are curved, which is typical for tree-dwelling primates. Uh, our feet are unique, really, uh, for walking upright. Um, the, the structure of the neck, 
uh, the rib, the typical uh, rib cage, I guess that's less definitive. Uh, the, the angle of the shoulder, which is designed for um, hanging, uh, we humans don't do that too well. We get sore. If you were, when you were a kid, if you were hanging on the, the monkey bars, your, your shoulders get sore after a while because we're not designed for that. But mainly the hip structure, the feet, the angle of the, the knee and so on. There's others, but those are some of the ones that I'm aware of. So perhaps you would take offense then, or not offense, that's the wrong word. You would take a, you would take, you would have a problem with how Owen Lovejoy and colleagues Donald Johansson reconstructed the hip. That that would be your, your yeah. problem there. So yeah. I've actually looked into this, um, I hear this from a lot of uh, creationists because I am actually an agnostic. I have no problem with theism, but I, I vehemently disagree with young earth creationism in particular. Um, and with regard to Lucy's pelvis, I, I actually have gotten to see many Australopith um, material myself. I've spent much of the summer in Kenya, and I can tell you, you know, for a fact that the reconstruction that Owen Lovejoy did of Australopithecus afarensis or Lucy's hip is correct. And the reason is because in order to get that thing into a chimpanzee morphology, you have to actually add bone in order to force a fusion at the pubic symphysis. You can't get it to fuse in the middle unless you had extra bone. If you force it into the chimp shape, there's a gap about this wide. Um, and Lucy's children would literally be falling out of her. So there is actually no biomechanical way. And I had a, a buddy of mine who studies hips, pelvis in particular um, here at my university, uh, drum up some, some models that I'm hoping to use in, in an upcoming video to show exactly what it would look like if, for instance, the answers in Genesis reconstruction uh, were correct. The, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis, as well as the sacrum, uh, cannot be maneuvered into a quadrupedal stance. It is definitively a biped. As for the knee, you've made some points uh, in your in your sort of conversation on revealed apologetics that, well, you know, other other apes have valgus knees, but not to the degree that humans do. Humans and australopiths actually, while they overlap with gibbons and orangutans, they, it's a ooh, it's a tiny overlap, and the australopith uh, range is firmly within. Um, the human range. Now, the feet are a different story because Lucy doesn't have any feet. However, we have more Australopiths than Lucy. Not only do we have others within Australopithecus afarensis, such as the Dikika child, but we also have others within the genus. So Australopithecus diva, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus garhi, I could go on. And among them, we actually have several full feet and the toe cannot be reconstructed, not in line and with the three arches. Um, the very last case that I would make is that Lucy's foramen magnum, or the hole at the base of her skull, is necessarily anterior. So she couldn't, if she were moving like a chimpanzee, her head would be cranked like this. Um, it's actually a very good way to tell how something moved is the location of that hole at the base of the skull. Um, so I don't think any case can be made that this animal, as someone who studies um, and has seen these fossils you know, for herself, I don't think that case can be made. And I'm currently working my way through Sanford and Rook's Contested Bones, where I just went through sentence by sentence their Australopithecus chapter. Um, and I found quite a bit wrong with that as well. Um, all my citations are in that video. So if you don't take me at my word, you can look into that. So thank you for letting me monologue. Sure, thank you. So to be clear, I want to make sure I understand the hip structure. You're saying that the hip structure is much like a human's, where it actually kind of points forward. With an, with a... Yes, it bowls, it's, it's a bowl shape. Okay. Um, the ilia, or the, the blades of the pelvis, are more sort of um, coronal is the orientation that we would use than what we see in modern humans. However, they're very similar to what we see in some of the other early hominins that, at least on revealed apologetics, you would consider firmly human. So my point here is that it's very difficult to draw a line between what is human and what is not, um, which is why sometimes I see answers in Genesis and ICR, I know you're not affiliated with either of them, but just as a, a point of note, disagree on which are firmly human and which are firmly ape. Well, yeah, I mean, you so know. So that's, that's good. Well, I appreciate that. Date. I'll have to look into the, to the data to see, you know, to check on that. Tell me a little bit more about the feet. You're it, saying the feet do not have curved phalanges? No, no, no. The phalanges are curved. You're absolutely correct oh, okay. in both the hands okay. and the feet. In fact, I'm a okay. firm, I'm a firm believer that the curved phalanges that Lucy was not spending all her time on the ground. Um, of course, okay. you know, many humans forage in the trees today, and many apes forage on the ground today. Non-human apes, okay. um, I would say. But, but the critical part is but, but... she does not have. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. 
I was just going to say that the, the claim is not that um, that she never could walk. We think she could knuckle walk. I think that every creationist I know of believes that. But if she has curved phalanges on her feet, it seems like that would not be the normal walking like we do would not be the normal load mode of locomotion. No, I would argue that the bipedalism that she that she um, engaged in was not identical to modern humans. In okay. fact, the holy footprints don't show a human gait. This is something I also hear from creationists a lot. Um, and I have an excellent biomechanics paper where what the researchers did is they took chimpanzees, humans, um, chimpanzees walking upright humans, and the late Tully footprints. And they had chimps and humans walk in an ash trail that would have been, that's the same consistency of the late Tully prints. Um, and then they took casts of the hunter-gatherer humans, so humans that spend all day barefoot, um, and the chimpanzees, and they compared them to the late Tully footprints. The biomechanics are intermediate. They are not human and they're not chimpanzee. So Lucy, because probably of these curved phalanges, she moved upright definitively. So this animal, and you know, I hear the knuckle walking thing. Only Bryant Richmond actually claims that. And it's, I, I have to tell you as someone who presented at the AVAs in this past year, no anthropologist that I am aware of uh, other than Brian Richmond is really arguing that, knuckle, that Lucy even had that knuckle walking complex in the, in the carpels. Um, it's it's quite slight, and you can find very much in the same same way that you talked about the valgus knee and orangutans and in gibbons, you can find slight traces of it in animals that don't knuckle walk today. So the point is that her entire suite is definitively bipedal, and that's something you know because I think that you know I'm sure you know Todd Wood and some of his students, younger creationists, um, who very much accept that Lucy was bipedal. They still don't think she's human, um, mm -hmm. and that is is more of a conversation that I'm willing to have, but. I have this conversation so often with younger creationists who say, no, she's, she's a knuckle walker and she's quadrupedal and she biomechanically couldn't be. Well, I appreciate so that. That's... It's interesting. It's outside my field of expertise. Um, it's something you might want to talk to uh, Martin Lubinell about that because a lot of the information I got was from him and he is an expert on that kind of stuff. And David Menton covered a lot of it as well. Okay. And he, you know, he's, he's a solid guy. He'd be open to correction if you can show him data, I'm sure. I kind of rely on him because he, he knows the field better than I do, but sure. by all means, share that with him and we'll make the corrections if they're necessary. Sure. Uh, and you and know. the only reason I'm, I'm asking you about the fossils is because in the interview you said, I'd love to talk about fossils. I wouldn't be okay. dive bombing you if you hadn't made it clear <laughs> that you, you were cool with talking about this because I fine. know how it is when, when, when you're talking outside of your field and it's easy to get stuff right. If we were talking um, astronomy or astrophysics, I, I can't remember, I think it was astrophysics, yes? I, I'm if sorry, we were you cannot Oh, I was asking, um, it, well, let me just put it this way. If we were in your field, I would be making mistakes as well. Um, my, my second thing I, I kind of wanted to talk about is the, the human chimpanzee uh, genetic similarity, which is something that uh -huh. um, you also mentioned on Revealed Apologetics. And I've actually tackled this quite a bit. I, I know some people who are you know involved in sequencing um, Svante Pabo just won the Nobel Prize the other day for his work with Neanderthals. So biological anthropology involves a lot more genetics than it used to. Um, so we, unfortunately for me, we have to learn a lot of genetics, um, at least in my in my graduate coursework. So, all right, because I do know we're, we got 15 minutes left. We do have a couple of people backstage still, but... And, well, that's, and, well, we go, well, that's, yeah, Anthony time is when we go, because when Anthony hosts, we always end up going longer, uh, but that's up to Dr. Lyle. <laughs> oh, sure. I don't, I don't want to hold anybody up unnecessarily. If there are people in line, I don't want to, um, I don't want to, uh, to hold them back. No, I'll leave that up, Dr. Lyle. Do you, do you oh, want to? Go ahead and ask about the, the genome. The genome. Yeah, I, I was yeah. curious. Um, do you, do you get your numbers there? Because I, I heard you mention the 80%, 84% number. Do you get that from, um, Dr. Tompkins, by chance? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, I have a huge problem with how Tompkins did his work uh, because Tompkins doesn't weight his sequences. So a, a base pair length that would be, let's say, 30 base pairs long, that is 85% similar between a chimp and a human, he weights though he weights those as identical to a you know 30,000 99% similarity, which right. as a guy who does a lot of math, I'm sure you know is is not how this is done. Um, and, you know, I thought I was kind of crazy when I first saw that. So I, I double checked with some other um, sort of people who are involved in, in genomics. Because again, it's, it's not my specialty. I'm not genomics. I was like, am I crazy with this? Um, and they downloaded his supplementary information. And, and that is correct. He, he doesn't weight his data. Um, and that is 
in my opinion, why he's seriously underestimating the numbers. As I'm, I'm sure as a math guy, you know, you, you would agree that that's going to give you something that's not, that's not how we compare human genomes, for instance, in a paternity test. Mm -hmm. um, you do full genomes and you, you weight the sequences. So, and, and I understand that for, as a young earth creationist, if Lucy walks upright and if humans are 98.8% similar, you can still be a young earth creationist and like those can still be true. Um, but, you know, I, I have other reasons why I don't like young earth creationism that we don't have time to talk about today. But that being said, you know, I just, I would really like it if we were all, you know, sort of being objective with the data. Um, and I'm not saying that you aren't because we all have to trust experts. And if you're mm -hmm. hearing experts tell you one thing, um, mm -hmm. and you know, it just so happens that they, they can be right, they can be wrong. My experts can be right and wrong. So it's one of those things where, where we just have to, to team up and make sure we're all looking at the, at the right stuff. Um, well, please contact uh, Jeff Tompkins over at ICR and um, express your concerns. I'd love to see how he responds to that. Um, I, um, one, of, one of my friends actually submitted something to the Answers Research oh. Journal um, as a correction a few years ago, but it never went through. So okay. I don't, maybe he has a, a direct number that's easier uh, to get a hold of, but I digress. I, I apologize for taking up so much time. Um, Dr. Well, Lel, do you by chance, um, do you, do you answer emails? Because I would love to pick your brain on your anisotropic model sometime. I, I try, but I got to tell you, I get more emails than I can possibly answer. But if you go to our website, biblical, yeah, you go to our website, biblicalscienceinstitute.com, there's a contact us. They, they come in, I read them. I just, there's, there's more than I can answer, but I'll, I'll try. Perfect. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll put that's a given in the title. So you're like, I remember that lady with the glasses from the okay. show. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you guys, I'll hop back. So there it is. Lyle, when confronted with someone who knows what they're talking about, backs off on the majority of his points, simply shunting it off to, I heard it from someone else. Now that sounds a lot like indoctrination to me. I thought that you'd taken the time yourself, as you and Eli had discussed, to look into these ideas, to these facts, to these claims, instead of just taking the word of somebody else. Now, I understand that I'm being quite glib here and quite a bit sassy, but like I did shoot Lyle an email. I wanted to have a longer conversation about it and he wasn't interested. And so like the more I the more I dug into how Lyle is and how he behaves and his presuppositionalism, the worse the taste in my mouth about the whole thing got. And I kind of came to the conclusion that like, yeah, Lyle is unconvincible. His presuppositionalism, his upbringing and his cognitive dissonance completely prevents him from like moving over on anything. You know, he, he kind of jokingly said, I'll admit that I'm, I don't know or that I'm wrong when I don't know something. Like, I don't know that he would do that because when I pointed out all of these discrepancies, his answer was, well, go, to, go talk to the person that I heard it from. I don't know, it's just a bummer. I would have thought that it would have been nice to have a conversation with Lyle that ended in, you know, him basically saying, and maybe he is doing this. Maybe maybe I'm nuts. Maybe he's actually gone out after this and he's reached out to the folks who he heard he's heard this from and confronted them on the ideas. But like, I would imagine that if that had happened, he would have reached back out to me. Um, I guess I was under the brief delusion that Lyle would behave in a way that was different from all of the amateur creationists online or the other young earth creationists that are sort of pseudo professionals who I've interacted with. Uh, but as of right now, that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, if Lyle does eventually watch this, great. Lyle, I'm, I'm sorry. Dr. Lyle, I'm sorry if, if this felt harsh to you, but I'm by all means very interested in having a conversation. I think that that would be fun and has the potential to be quite fruitful, although I'm not really interested in the precept stuff, so I might be uh, not your target audience here. But I thought this was a fun little exchange, a fun little series of events on my journey and your journey with me through discussing younger creationism and talking with younger creationists and trying to really suss out how it is that all these guys manage to believe what it is that they believe. I, as I said earlier, I do find it very interesting. And of course, it also speaks to the danger of offhandedly talking outside of your field, especially if the knowledge that you got about the field you're talking about is secondhand from someone else. And when confronted with, you know, the idea that it might not be true, your answer is just, uh oh, well, maybe you should talk to them about it. Not good. And so my gentle and of course very modern apes, I hope this was enjoyable for you. If you like what I do, please consider joining my Patreon, liking, commenting, subscribing, all of that jazz. And um, I will see you next time.